Hi, everybody. Welcome to 10 Apps in 10 Weeks. This is Restaurant Alley. This app will show you local restaurants in a uh, specific distance from your location. And you're looking at the screen of my mobile device running the PhoneGap testing app. So here we go, the app loads. And now you can see the restaurants that are close to where I'm sitting right now. We've got a, uh, let's see, we've got Subway, we've got Bistro Basque, Rainbow Gardens, Stonebridge. I've eaten at most of these. Archie Moore's, which is famous for their wings. Cafe Atlantique, my favorite coffee shop. Be there later this afternoon. So you're actually looking at this on my device, and this is what the final app would look like once deployed, but this is obviously for testing. So I'm going to show you exactly how this app is made. You'll be able to go through the code yourself and even make some changes. So this testing is happening on my actual device. You're just seeing a reflection of my device in the browser using a little app that I have. We can also test the app in the browser itself because this is an HTML5 app. So here's the version in the browser testing. And this is running, as you can see, directly from my drive. So this is going from the phone using a URL that the app I have that reflects the screen. This is running directly from the actual uh, index.html file where I have the uh, code for this particular application. And of course, we would do most of the testing here in the browser because it's much more, uh, it's much easier to access the uh, code directly from the browser and make changes than reloading it on the phone. One thing you should note for testing, you're going to need what's called the cores plugin. Um, if you just search allow control origin plugin, and I suggest you test with Chrome. There's a couple of these. The one I use is called the Cores Toggle. What that does is it switches off for the purpose of testing cross-site scripting security. The phone doesn't have this type of security, so it can access most web services directly. So you're gonna to need to install this and have it going. Otherwise, you're gonna get an error. Let me show you what happens if this is off and you're testing on your phone in case you run into this. So I'm just gonna switch my Cores Toggle off and I'm gonna refresh allowed it to view my location. See down here, it gives me this access control. It says no access control allow origin header is present. And again, that's some browser security that's not present in the phone itself. So as soon as I turn that back on, we'll again get the local results from the application. There you go. So just make sure you download that before you do your testing. Also recommend that you have for testing on your phone, two applications. One is the PhoneGap desktop application. I'm running that right here. And what it is basically is a little server that serves out your application to the phone. And then you access it from on the phone, the PhoneGap phone application, which you can get from the App Store. So th what you're gonna do is, when you run the desktop application, see down here it gives you a server address. You're just gonna make sure that server address is entered on your phone, and then when you press connect, it'll actually connect to that server, which is serving out your PhoneGap app. So this way you can test on the phone as you go. And then of course you can add any of your PhoneGap applications right here. And also you can use the PhoneGap desktop app to create a new PhoneGap project. It'll create a skeleton for your application. So the way I suggest you do that is by clicking plus. And I like to use the blank application. That's just a template that I can give you. Choose where you wanna store it. Mine is stored in documents and apps. Give it a name. Um, so I'll call this restaurant, R-E-S-T-A-U-R, row, and make sure, of course, you're choosing a unique name, and then an ID, which is usually your URL in reverse, so tv.learntoprogram.restaurantrow. This has to be unique if you're putting it in the App Store because the app store is gonna identify by this ID. 
Then when you click Create Project, it's actually going to create the project. Of course, mine is already created, so I don't need to do this. It's created and it appears right here, and it's being served through this URL listed at the bottom. There's also a little log here which will tell you if there's security problems or anything like that with your application. So you can look at the log and get a little bit of insight into something going wrong. Very, very useful for testing PhoneGap apps. You can get both of these at PhoneGap.com and the PhoneGap desktop app is right here. PhoneGap developer app, that's the mobile app. You can get that either in the app store or there are links right here for iOS, Android, or if you're the last person in the United States with a Windows phone, they have that link as well, right at PhoneGap.com. So that should get you all set up in your environment. Now there's a couple of different ways of creating and testing PhoneGap apps. This is how I do it. Other experts may do it in a different way. That's fine, um, but this is the set of tools that I use and again, you know, if as you become more expert, you're welcome to switch it up, but uh, this is how I do it. All right, so when you create your application, let's take a look at the actual application on the drive. If we go into my documents and apps here, there's Restaurant Row. You'll see a couple of folders, uh, hooks, platforms, plugins, our friend www and a config XML file. Really the only two areas in which we're gonna play are the www folder. The www folder is essentially a web application. That's why it's called www. And that's projected by PhoneGap as a normal app in the application itself. So what you're looking at here, this web app, if we look at the screencast, this is just has a, basically a browser window that's taking the web app and displaying it as if it were a regular app on my phone. Pretty easy how that works. Okay, so I think we're almost ready to dig into the code. There's one more thing I wanna show you, and that's this config file. A Couple of things we're gonna to need to add to the config file in order for the application to work on the phone. So if you open the config file, it's an XML file. Now there's stuff in here that you probably should update. For example, the description, your author email, your your uh, website if you have one, an author name. So I could change this to, oops, could change this to my name right here. And then lines 11 through 17 I added. Be very careful as you're adding these if you're doing this from scratch. The first line simply allows it to access any origin URL and then allows it to navigate to any origin URL. And the rest essentially sets a context, a content security policy, which allows it to access the outside world. Be a little bit careful. Probably in real life production, I would not have it this open. I would nail this down to the actual URLs and services I needed to access for testing this is fine. So make sure you do your config XML. Be very, very careful to get the code correct. Uh, if you're copying from the video, I'd suggest you pause the video and go ahead and make sure you get all these characters correct because um, there's quite a bit of syntax in there. And as you know, if you're one or two letters off, that uh, might not work for you. Okay, so that's the config XML. Now, config XML is outside the www folder. Inside the www, fold, www folder is all the code I wrote for the application. So just to orientate you, the index.html, that's our main file. I've got the main program code in here. Um, surprisingly, this is only 119 lines and, and some of it is boilerplate. Um, and like, for example, you get all of the viewport stuff up here from the uh, boilerplate when you actually create the PhoneGap app. Uh, I have a cores.js. This is a generic uh, cross object request function that allows you to communicate with outside web services. This is generic um, and there's thousands of programs that use this exact code swiped right off the web i didn't write this and, and we'll go over it as the time comes but it's it's just gives me this create cores request function um that i use in the program itself and we also have a let's see restaurant.js file let's open that 
And this essentially defines what a restaurant object is. I wrote this, and this just allows us to create an object called a restaurant that's got a name, a location, a rating, a price level, and a photo, just like you saw in the app itself. So these are all of the objects that make up an actual restaurant, right? We've got a name, Subway Restaurants, a location, a rating, a price level. How did Subway get two two dollar signs for price i guess sometimes this stuff isn't that accurate subway is about as cheap as you can get and then a photo so all of this is encapsulated in this restaurant object a a generic object that i created for my own use that's all the files so we're going to spend most of our time um oh there's also this the generic restaurant image for a restaurant that didn't have an image in the google web service i went ahead and swiped that one and then we've got our index file, which is where we're going to spend most of our time. This is where the actual application runs. Okay, so the first thing I did, I used jQuery throughout this particular application. jQuery is a, I want to say like a kind of a JavaScript power user library. It gives you a lot of tools, both for convenience and power that you don't get with with javascript so the way you're going to get this if you go to jquery mobile which is just jquerymobile.com and then go to the download tab you're going to see options for the jquery cdn which means content delivery network just copy those three lines just like that copy swipe them and put them at the top of your code what this is is links to the style sheet for jquery which is the jQuery styles and the actual JavaScript code for jQuery. You get the JavaScript core library here and then the JavaScript mobile library, which is a specialized library for JavaScript mobile. These are delivered by a very fast content delivery network and minified. So uh, it gets in there pretty fast. Then I have the key.js file. This is my own file. The key.js file has one line of code. It looks like this. And inside the quotes, I have my Google Developers API key. We're going to be using the Google Places API in this application. So let me explain this to you, because you're going to need to get your own. You can't use mine. If we search Google Places API, get this Google Places API. This is all of the documentation for the API, which is the application programming interface that we're using. And this is how we're getting the information about the restaurants. So if you take a look, there's APIs for Android, iOS, JavaScript, or a web service. So if you click on the HTTP one, and it shows you an actual demo down here of the data that you request and the data you come that comes back. So we'll be making this kind of request here. But one of the things it requires is an API key. So if you see down here, quick start steps, get a key. If you go ahead and click get a key and then you follow those steps, signing into your Google account, it'll assign you a unique, unique key. That unique key is a hash. It's a long series of characters that uniquely identifies you. So you're going to want to create a key.js file that defines a variable key, and then you put the key you're actually assigned in there, because I can't give you mine. Because then you could do all sorts of evil things that I'm not going to allow you to do. Oops, we just get rid of this file. We don't need it. So you'll make your own key.js file like that. The cores file you have. Right, this is our create cores request method, which is how we're going to communicate with the external service. I'll show you that as we come to it. And then the restaurant JS, which I showed you a moment ago, is included. And that actually includes this is actually creates the object for the restaurant. This each one of these objects is going to represent a different restaurant that's returned by the app, name, location, rating, price level, and photo. In the style sheet, this I don't think it actually is doing anything. I was trying to mess around with the actual photos and get them to look better in the app itself. But the problem is that all the photos are different sizes because they're submitted by users. So there's really not a lot I could do to make these look uniform or even. 
um, which is a shame. I, I might, you know, display this a different way in a production app, but, um, you know, really since it was coming from Google's data, not a lot I could do about the photos here. So um, this actually probably is non-functional and you can take out this style sheet entirely. Matter of fact, if we take it out and save and then uh, restart our app, I don't think there's going to be any difference in the way that it's actually displayed. Let's see here. Takes a second to load all the data. Yeah, it looks exactly the same to me. So that's actually not doing anything. All right. I tried. Um, I do have a little style sheet here that's essentially centering the header and the footer. So the text in the header here and the footer at the bottom is centered. And now we have our body of our document. Inside the body of the document, I've used jQuery's page metaphor, which is what gives us the header, footer, and main content area that you saw. Let me pull this up again. So if we go to the top of the app, you see we've got that restaurant row. That's coming from the header. So the way jQuery works is it has these elements called data roles or these attributes called data roles. So the data role for a page in this logical division contains a header, as you can see here. It contains a footer with our, where I just put a copyright at the bottom. And then it contains a main area with the class UI content. And in that main area, this I put myself, a div with the ID result. That's kind of how I do it. And then what will happen is as the content is generated from the Google Web Service and formatted, it'll be stuck inside this result div. Okay, so that's kind of the, the uh, jQuery method of setting up a page. And it looks like an app, right? It looks like a normal app. It doesn't look so much like a web page. All right, so now we have our, I have this crossed out for now because I'm not actually using any of the Cordova library. The Cordova library is the actual PhoneGap library. Cordova is the open source library, which contains all the different ways that the phone can be hooked into JavaScript. So for example, if you want to use the phone's accelerometer, there's a Cordova library for that. I'm not actually using any of these. So I had that commented out because we don't really need to load it. All right, so now we have the actual central script for the application, and this is all the code I wrote to make the application work, plus what's in restaurant.js. So let's get started going through this. The first thing I did is I created a blank global array called restaurant list. We're going to need the restaurant list inside several of the methods that uh, we're using here. So... I went ahead and created a restaurant list array object we're gonna use later. Now down here, really we shouldn't start running our app until an on device ready function or on device ready event fires. That's part of phone gap. So if we're gonna use this, right, I've gotta use the Cordova library. And this essentially says the device is ready for us to start working on. Now you notice it worked with me firing the on device ready function directly, but I went ahead and did this the way we should do it if we're gonna distribute it. Let's just test real quickly. So let's bring in our app again. So now we're loading the Cordova library and we're actually gonna run this when the device ready function occurs. The device ready function essentially says that again, we've drawn everything and we're good to go. And here you can see it's working the exact same way. Now for testing on the browser, now this will not work on the browser because the browser doesn't have a device ready. So while you're testing on the browser, you're gonna to need to do the opposite of what I just did, which is run the on device ready function directly. But here, since we're now testing primarily on the device, I've gone ahead and used the on device ready event, which again is called by PhoneGap when the device is ready. And this is calling a function called on device ready. So device ready event occurs from PhoneGap. 
right? The phone gap essentially says, okay, the device is ready. So we have a listener listening for that event, calling the on-device ready function when that occurs. The on-device ready function is where we really start the interesting stuff in our code. So here, when the device is ready, what we need to do is we need to get the location of the device, right? Because if we don't, if the device doesn't know where it is, it can't send that information to Google to get the restaurants that are nearby. So when the device is ready, the on device ready function is called. Using the navigator object, we call the geolocation object and the get current position method. The get current position method has three arguments. The first one is the function you call back if you successfully get the position on success. The second is the function you call if you get an error. I called mine on error. These are arbitrary names. It could be Ernie and Bert, but I wanted to make names that made sense. And then we have our maximum age. This is the oldest information you'll accept as far as, per, as far as position. I think three seconds is okay because how far can you get? Same restaurants. How long you're gonna wait before you call a timeout? Five seconds. And do we want a high level of accuracy? Might as well, so we enable that as true. So these are the options in a little JSON package there. And so now what's gonna happen is we're gonna run the get current position function and if we're successful, we'll run on success. If we get an error, we're simply gonna console out the error message and the program will stop there. But on success, we're gonna pass to the on success function a position object. The position object contains our latitude and longitude. We get that from position.quards.latitude and position.quards.longitude. So we're passed into this function. This is a callback function because we're not sure how long it's going to take the device to determine our exact position, right? It may take a second, it may take four seconds, whatever it takes, the on success function fires when we have that position and then we get the position, ob in position object, we extract the latitude and longitude out of that object and then we're gonna call the get local restaurants function that I wrote and pass that the latitude and longitude. So now we're gonna come down here. And the way we communicate with the Google API using the web services method is via a URL. So we're gonna create that URL and we've gotta create it as a string. So that string is https maps.googleapis.com slash maps slash api slash place slash nearby search now we're making a json request we want to get json back as opposed to xml then we have a query string where we provide the location the latitude and longitude that um we had obtained before and passed into this function and then a radius like how big of a area do we want to look so i think this is meters um and then the types of facilities we want information back from so this is food there's other types like schools and things like that you'd have to check the documentation and then we append our key remember our key is in the special javascript file so you're going to use your key here one of the reasons I don't have it here, aside from I don't want you to see it, is that this allows just an extra layer of security. Just one more step to get your key. Not that big of a deal. If someone really wanted to get it, they could. So now we're going to make the request from the Google Web Service. So I'm going to create an object called XHR, cross-site request. And I'm going to pass the create cores request function to elements. One is the method, either get or post. We're going to use get because we're using query strings here. And then the URL, which we just made in the URL variable. So the method in the URL gets passed to the create cores request function, get, and the URL. And this essentially becomes an XML HTTP request. We're not worried about credentials, we're not using them. So 
It's going to come down here. It's going to create our domain request. It's going to open that actual request and then send it back to the XHR object. So this is our, essentially our request object that's being created. And then we're going to say, okay, what happens when there's actually a load object and this function, a load event, meaning we get something back from the actual function. And what are we going to do at that point? So here we've got the function that's going to respond when we get data back. Now, if you did this the old way, you might remember you had to track the ready state and all that. This is the newer method of making these uh, web service requests, and it's a lot more efficient because you don't have to track the, um, the ready state. It's all done behind the scenes. Okay, so now we've done that, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the data that comes back. So the data that comes back when the onload occurs is in xhr.responseText. So let's just take a quick look at what xhr.responseText looks like. So I'm going to do console log xhr.responseText. Now here, because we're again going to be testing in the browser, let me switch these up. All right, so we're going to go ahead and test in the browser. And we're going to test this way. So let's refresh. All right, and here in the console is exactly what I wanted to show you. So this is the raw data that comes back from Google based on our request. So we gave it a location and it's coming back with this raw data. Now this raw data can be confusing. So here's what I'm gonna do. Let's just go ahead and grab this data, just like that. I'm gonna copy it, and there's a site called JSON Viewer. It's jsonviewer.stack.hu. And what it'll allow you to do is Paste the results of your JSON variable in there, and it'll give you a nice formatted view into your JSON. So here I can see that inside the results node, these are all my restaurants results, 0 through 13. Here's the first one. It's called Dragon Garden 3. And there's a lot of data in here, like the opening hours, the photos, which I'll explain in a few minutes. That's a that's an object to itself. Um, this applies under restaurant food points of interest and establishments. The categories, the address is called the vicinity, the rating, the price level. So we use a lot of this data. So this is what's coming back inside this text. All of this data is here, and if you look carefully, you can see a lot of it. So let's see here. Uh, vicinity three hundred five New Haven Avenue, Milford close to my house. Convenience store, store, food. So you can see all this data here. And there's actually a lot of data as far as the location, the exact latitude and longitude, because we wanted to plot it on the map, even the uh, edges of the building as far as Google knows. So lots of information here. It even gives you map icons that if you wanted to see what those look like, this is the gas station icon. You get the idea. So this is what's being sent back to our application. So our application is going to have to parse this and deal with it. All right, let me take out that console log because we don't need it anymore. So we are get local restaurants. So that's the response from a web service. Now, obviously, we can't show that to users. We've got to go ahead and actually work with that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that response we're going to parse the JSON so it becomes an object that we can easily navigate through. So once it's parsed, let me show you the difference. Let's console here log the actual parsed JSON object. This is pretty cool. You're going to like this. All right, so let's bring this back up. Let's refresh again. Allow. And now take a look at the object. It's not just one big string. 
But now we can actually parse right through here and see all the data in key value pairs. So here's the zero with restaurant name, Dragon Garden 3, opening hours, photos, price level, rating. So all that data, vicinity is right here. So now it's an object that the browser understands. And remember that all our results are here, right? We have zero through 13, we got 14 results. So we're gonna need to loop through these to extract the information you see in each row. We're gonna to have to get the name, the vicinity, or the address, the rating and the price. So here, this is a loop. This is a for each loop done jQuery style. It's an each method. And what it does is say, okay, let's loop through restjson.results. So we have that JSON, and we're gonna loop through the results object in there. Now, where that came from is here. Here's our object. So everything we want is inside results. So it becomes restjson.results. Now we can loop through zero through 13, I will represent the element number, which I don't use in this case, but I'll use a little bit later. And entry will represent each element as it loops through. So as we loop through, zero will become entry. Then one will be stored in entry, then two, till we get to the end. So first time through we're on zero. And now, if you remember a long time ago, I created this restaurant object and included it. And this is how we're going to store each restaurant is in this object. It has a name, a location, a rating, a price level, and a photo. So each restaurant's gonna go into one of these restaurant objects. That's what I'm doing here. I'm creating a variable called restaurant local to the loop and creating a new restaurant object. And it has from the entry, right from zero, one, two, three, four, the name, the vicinity, which is just how address is labeled, the rating, the price level, and then the photos object. And then I'm pushing this onto the restaurant list array, which we defined first thing. Remember this guy? So this is an array of these restaurant objects. So I'm creating a bunch of these restaurant objects and I'm putting them onto the array, and that's happening right here. The array is called restaurant list. Push adds an element to the end of the array, and I'm adding the restaurant object. So because they're all stored in the restaurant list object, I am creating a new restaurant variable each time. So the next thing we'll do is we'll go to the next element in the JSON, element one. It becomes entry. We'll create an object with its name, vicinity, its rating, its price level and photos. We'll put that on the array. So when we've done all this, we've got this array called restaurant list that's got all these restaurant objects on it. I'm going to, now this actually isn't necessary because it's a global object. Um, take that out, that's not doing anything. And that's gonna be passed, that array is going to be stored in memory. And then we're gonna call the show restaurants function. The show restaurants function creates the visual that you see in the app itself, right? It creates this list that you see right here, right? It creates this, this essentially this table with all the restaurant information. So you can see now we're getting into creating the HTML that we're gonna display. Now this is called a list view in jQuery. So I set the data role to list view and a list view is made of an unordered list of the list view items. And I gave it an ID called rest view short for restaurant view. I'll use that here as well. So now we're gonna loop through the restaurant list. So I created this array restaurant list. Now we're gonna loop through it. And as we loop through, this will represent the key for each one, zero, one, two, three, through 13. And entry will again represent each individual restaurant entry on the array. I created the variable called out and I'm going to append to it a list item. 
with first the photo. So I created a function called get photo HTML. What it does is it gets the actual URL of the photo. So if we get get photo HTML, we send the photo object because if you'll remember, right, even inside our object, here's our Dragon Garden restaurant, there's a photo object and in here is the information about the photo. The photo reference is what we need, this hash right here. So I've got to go into the photo object. So for the individual, for the zeroth element of the array, we're going to get the photo and we're going to get that, but we're going to create the URL if there is a photo from the Google APIs and the photo reference. We'll get the photo reference hash. We'll again use our key and that creates the URL. What I'm going to return is an image tag. And that image tag will include the URL to display it. Now, if there is no photo for that entry, this will come up as null. This if statement will evaluate as false, and we're just gonna return the generic image. So this is essentially either getting the image from the Google APIs or returning a generic image, and that's, going here at the top of the list item. So this becomes that image tag that we're creating in get photo based on the photo object from the original JSON. Now we're going to extract in an H2 the name from the restaurant object. We're going to extract the location from the array object, the restaurant object on the array, the rating, and then the price. And with the price, I just created a quick price function, which takes the price and returns dollar signs. So if it's inexpensive, it's one dollar sign. Because the Google data price levels like one, two, three, four, five, I just change those into dollar signs here and then displayed the price as a number of dollar signs. You remember that here because we found out Subway is much more expensive than I expected. But these are about right. Cafe Atlantic is pretty cheap. Seven C's, it's a good place. So we've replaced the dollar signs. The ratings were straight out because they had decimals. I didn't want to make that complicated. I just displayed the rating here. So this creates the actual element. We close the list item for each one of these after we iterate through every restaurant on the restaurant list array. We then close that unordered list. So we've got this unordered list stored in the variable out. We can actually see the whole unordered list that's constructed. We'll just do a quick console out here so you can see it. And let's take a quick look here in the browser and let's refresh. And here you can see the unordered list, unordered list, list item. There's the image. If you look carefully in there, there's the H2 Subway restaurants, the address. So it's all in here. So we're actually writing this HTML to be displayed here. So we've written all the HTML. The next step is to display it. So remember that result div that I created way back here to hold the results, div IDs results. So now we're actually going to access it too far. Right here, we're going to grab the result div. This is jQuery for get element by ID result. I'm going to grab the result element and I'm going to set its HTML to the out variable. So I'm going to stick that in there. The last thing we need to do is wake up the list view by initializing it and then refreshing it. So this will get the list that we just created because remember I gave this the ID restaurant view. So I'm going to take the unordered list. It initializes that as a list view in jQuery and then refreshes it so it displays correctly. And that's essentially the program. So a pretty exciting, I think, program that does some neat things that you can actually, I think is pretty useful. Now, something you could probably add to this if you wanted to is to make each element clickable in the application itself. So, for example, what happens if we touched taste of thigh. 
because t- taste of thigh, not taste of thigh, you can get actually additional information from the Google Places API. So I would you know go ahead and modify this and make it your own, but you've got the start of a very interesting application. Good luck with it. I hope you have fun.